Today, friends, we would like to speak on the subject of enlargement, of enlarging our vision, and so forth. God wants to enlarge our thinking. We are to think bigger. The Lord is about to do tremendous things in the earth. And we are about to experience the greatest revival of human history. When we read Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32, God promises to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Awesome signs and wonders before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. This has only had a partial fulfillment in the book of Acts. When we read Isaiah 54 verse 2, we're told, Enlarge the place of your tent, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. We are to prepare ourselves and our churches for great increase. Multitudes are going to be coming to our churches. The Lord said to Abraham, before he had any children, I will cause you to grow into a multitude. You're going to be a father of many nations. So let's not limit God in our thinking. We need our vision, our expectation enlarged. Let's remember the prayer of Jabez. Remember that prayer? He asked God for five things, and I'd like to go through this right now from 1 Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Enlarge my border, that your hand might be with me your presence, your protection, your provision, that you would keep, that, that your hand might be with me, uh, that you would keep me from evil, and that it may not grieve me. And listen, God granted him what he requested. So, <clears throat> in Luke, 17 verse 5, the apostles asked, Lord, increase our faith. And then Matthew 17 verse 20, Jesus said to them, If you have faith as tiny as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Be removed from yonder place and re and it will remove, and nothing shall be impossible for you if you have faith. But we need God's faith. Faith actually is like a muscle. It's developed by exercise and having good nutrition. With God's faith in us, we can command situations to change. We need God's faith. And... We need to have an attitude, God can use us, God can use me. But also remember, faith works in a soft heart. When Israel hardened their hearts in the wilderness, they couldn't believe God for anything. We need to think bigger. Sometimes we are a bit too logical though. Our natural mind can be an enemy of our faith. Remember when the Lord fed 5,000 people plus with just a handful of food? Nothing is impossible with God. We need to think bigger. When we read John chapter 15, we have the illustration of Christ being the vine. We are the branches. We draw all of our life from him. In this illustration, <clears throat> Christ makes it clear that he wants us 
to bear much fruit. Listen to chapter 15, verse 8 of John's Gospel. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. God is glorified when we bear much fruit. Well, the Lord later states in chapter 15, verse 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. God not only wants good fruit, he wants much fruit, and fruit that remains. And he also wants the fruit of the Holy Spirit mightily developed in us, too. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> well, let's see if we can balance the prosperity message. Sometimes it goes a little too far the other way. In Philippians 4, verse 12, Paul states, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and also to suffer need. Joseph of Genesis knew how to have victory when he was in the dungeon and when he was on the throne. What a difference to keep victory when he was in prison and when he's on the throne. He kept a humble spirit and dependence on God always. There are times when we need much, but other times when we have little. And we need to experience both the good times and the lean times. Well, when we read Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 8 and 9, it states this, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of the Lord my God in vain. We should never take the vow of poverty, of course. But also, Lord, I don't want more than I can handle and become proud and lose my dependence on you. Often, prosperity makes people forget God and not depend on Him. Poverty also doesn't produce anything godly either. We need both the good times and the difficult times to develop us. But God always wants us to be rich spiritually with much of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, His divine nature produced in us. He wants our prayers to save many people. He wants to fill us with his word and wisdom. He wants to bring, well, we want to bring much honor to God, is what I'm trying to say, and help many other people know and love him tremendously. And when we get to heaven, we want to bring many other people with us. So let's be wealthy with the right kind of riches. We want eternal treasure. In Psalm 4, verse 1, King David declared, You have enlarged me when I was in distress. Difficulties and trials enlarge us prepares us for greater blessing. This, uh, these things give us an ability to receive more from God. Well, in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 to 5, 
I'm going to read sections of this. It states this. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon you. His glory shall be seen upon you. And the people and leaders shall come to the brightness of your rising. In verse 5, the abundance of the Gentiles shall be converted unto you. The greatest revival comes in a time when it's the very darkest. And we're getting there now. Friends, there's a beautiful promise in the book of Job, chapter 8 and verse 7. Though your beginning was small, yet your latter end shall increase mightily. You know, even though we may have had a very small beginning, God can make our latter end very fruitful. Why does, why does God bless us? It's so that we can bless others, many others, and bring pleasure to God. But often we must first experience some humiliating times. Well, I'm going to use America here for an example. God has blessed America so that we can be a light to the world. But today, many Christians are not doing a very good job, like we should. America is no longer a good example to the world like it should be. When God blesses us, what are we going to use our enlargement for? Will we use our blessing to help others? Or will we, we become slack and careless? The Apostle Paul said this, that he was a debtor to all men. In Romans 1, verse 14. Why did he say this? God had forgiven him a huge debt. He had persecuted 10,000 Christians in his past. And God totally forgave him. Can you imagine he became the writer of half the New Testament books? Well, now he felt in debt to share this gospel truth to everyone. God gave tremendous mercy to show mercy to many others. That was Paul's example. Many years ago, there was a revival in New Zealand. And God asked them a question. What are you going to use your blessing for? You know, every gift or blessing we have is so we can bless others. We are not to selfishly fill ourselves and forget others. Lord, give me more so that I can bless many others. God gives us certain strengths, even to help our mate when they're weak. That's a very important issue. All through the Bible, we have these particular words. The word, increase, abound. Enlarge, abundance, multiply, fruitfulness, and many, many other similar words that signify enlargement and blessing. When we read Deuteronomy chapter 6 and chapter 8, God repeats something over and over to his people. And we need to remember this. God said, I'm bringing you into a wonderful land, but be careful 
when you prosper, that you don't forget the Lord, your God. This is the reason God takes his time to work in our lives before he blesses us tremendously. Very few people can handle abundance. And God is preparing us for something very big. I have found that few in the Bible are able, were able to handle prosperity. When you look at Samson, when you look at Uzziah and others, I want to read 2 Chronicles 26, 16. It says, re regarding Uzziah, When he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Read 2 Chronicles 26, 16. Proster prosperity can be dangerous too. Because the, t the tendency when, we're, when things are going so well is not to depend on God, but to become careless. Now we want to be used by the Lord to our maximum potentials. But God knows our limits. And so we need to say, Lord, give me as much as possible, but not one bit more than I can handle. Lord, keep me perfectly on course all the way to the finish line. Lord, when I stand before you, I want to hear you say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Well, as we close, I want to look at sections of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and chapter 8. Uh, and I want us to look at these warnings that when things go so well, not to forget God. All right, I'm going to read now from Deuteronomy 6, verse 10 and 12. It shall be when the Lord your God shall have brought you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you great and goodly cities which you didn't build, houses full of good things which you didn't fill, wells digged that you didn't dig, vineyards, olive trees which you didn't plant. When you shall have eaten and you're full, beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. Well, I want to look at a few other verses from Deuteronomy. For the Lord your God brings you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land full of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land wherein you shall eat bread without scarceness. You shall not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you may dig brass. When you have eaten in your full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he's given you. But beware that you do not forget the Lord your God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments, his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten in your full and built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when your herds and flocks multiply, your silver and your gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness where were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought forth water out of the rock of Flint, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, 
which your fathers knew not, that he might humble you, that he might prove you to do you good at your latter end. And you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me all this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Read Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7 to 18. Friends, all these things are for our learning and our warning. And we, God wants to prepare us to be used mightily. And when we are, we do not want to become careless but always remain humble and dependent on God. Amen. God bless you. Amen.